I get in big trouble about this all the time within our group, that I plant the flag on grasslands too strongly. But if there's another ag system out there that can do the things we need, hold on to soil, hold on to nutrients, create biodiversity, foster biodiversity, I want to hear about it. Let's talk about it. But I don't think there is, just based on science and data and experience. So I'm Randy Jackson and I'm a professor of grassland ecology in the Department of Agronomy at UW-Madison. And today I'm here to talk about grasslands, all things grasslands, in particular uh, the importance of grasslands for our agricultural system. So uh, the Kickapoo Reforestation Fund, the Newsom Family Fund, has been uh, provided generous research support to my program. and. Part of that support has been a couple of projects that I want to talk about today that are related to how grazing uh, grassland can uh, help us hold on to water, help us slow down water, um, help us hold on to nutrients and improve water quality, help us build soils and improve soil health, and um, talk about how important it is for agriculture to adopt more of it for all those reasons. In the spirit of dialogue, I, this is the uh, Driftless Dialogue series. I just, if this turns into a conversation, that would be the best case scenario. I'm really not into lecturing all day. Uh, I do enough of that during the week. And uh, my kids told me this morning, don't do it, Dad. Don't do your lecture, as I was writing my notes. So they said I would look like a preacher if I stood here with my book <laughs> reading. So I'm not going to do that. But I do want to thank uh, Marcy for the invitation in particular. So. I want to get into some specific research projects that we've been doing, but first I want to take the opportunity to couch those projects in the larger context of a big USDA project that we've uh, been working on for about a year. I do want to put all this in the context of a bigger project that I'm part of and, and helping to lead, and that's a USDA funded um, grant that is um, called Grassland 2.0. And the idea of Grassland 2.0 is that we have to develop a plan for how to move our agricultural systems from annual row crops to perennial grasslands as the dominant form of cropping system. Our agriculture needs to look at the ecosystem functions of the original prairie and use those functions as a yardstick for improving uh, as we move into the 21st century. And the Grassland 2.0 project was a response, it came as a response to a call for proposals from USDA um, for sustainable agriculture research. And basically they said in their call for proposals, tell us what a sustainable ag system looks like by the year 2050. Constrain it a little bit, pick a place, pick a type of livestock, in, uh, a type of agricultural industry and uh, tell us what it looks like, but then most importantly, tell us how we're going to get there, identify what the impediments are, and what the opportunities are for overcoming those impediments. So a bunch of us at UW and University of Minnesota and some other organizations that I'll talk about a little bit uh, got together and decided we should pick the livestock production system of the upper Midwest very broadly and start with a focus on dairy and beef grazing in uh, uh, dairy and beef production in Wisconsin. So that's the Grassland 2.0 project at the very highest level. And um, it's a really exciting project because it's five years long. Uh, it's focused on grassland, which is sort of a pretty marginalized within the USDA uh, research portfolio historically. And it's $10 million for, for those five years. So there's a lot of intense activity going on. And I want to talk a little bit about some of that work that's happening uh, here today. So um, in the meantime, the Newsom funding had gotten a couple of other projects started that, that I want to get to here. And I've actually got some data to share with you and that sort of thing. Um, one of those projects is a runoff study, which is relevant to the issues that Marcy raised with uh, water uh, quantity. And uh, Marcy was telling me about this riparian area down here being flooded uh, a couple years ago. And of course, we all know about the flooding issues in this part of the world. So the more we can understand how we can do productive agriculture and 
help mitigate that, but at the same time adapt to a change in climate, the better, we, the better off we'll be. So that was the impetus for one of the studies that I'll talk about. And then the other study is this sort of budding, emerging project with the Valley Stewardship Network and, and the Pasture Project to look at water quality uh, in, uh, in this part of the world. And Tanner Creek has been a real focal point, as many of you probably know. Uh, but we really want to expand that and, and, and look at a very broad scale across the whole lower Wisconsin River Basin and try and understand how the degree of perennial agriculture in a sub-watershed affects the water quality and then aggregate that up. So um, that's sort of the broad overview for what I'd like to talk about today. Um, I've talked a little bit about what Grassland 2.0 is already, um, but... The critical thing that I left out is that one of the things that we're focused on is not only trying to find ways to restore our agricultural systems to be more like the original prairie, but to really build a genuine, uh, a genuine program of what my colleague at, at University of Minnesota, Nick Jordan, calls JEDI uh, ethos into the project. And JEDI is his acronym for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so we're really grappling and, and wrestling with how to do that, given that we didn't write the proposal in that way. Certainly it's been on a lot of our minds over the years how to do this. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do now is bake that into the project. And of course this gets to land access and labor issues and things that are way outside of my expertise. So we have a a real broad range of scientists and, and experts that are helping us uh, work on all that. It's clear that grazing on perennial grassland is one of the best adaptation strategies we have in agriculture to climate change. And as much as uh, that extreme flooding is driven by a change in climate, but it's also partly driven by the way we manage the uplands. So there's an important interaction there that we have to address. We have to address land use change at the same time that we're, which is part of mitigating climate change, because perennial grassland should hold on to nutrients that are helping to drive climate change. But in as much as climate change is going to continue to happen, no matter what we do today in the short term, we have to come up with some adaptation strategies and grazing perennial grasslands is a good one there. Uh, of course, this part of the world, Coon Valley and the Kickapoo, uh, uh, et cetera, was, is world renowned for responding to that crisis, working with people like Leopold, Aldo Leopold, to help find ways to heal and re restore the earth and, and the soil and, and cropping systems. And uh, they did a beautiful job of putting things back in place. Um, but I probably also don't have to convince you that while we sort of repaired the gouges, the, the ag systems continue to bleed out. They're very leaky. They're just inherently leaky. And there's no amount of band-aids that are going to stop them from bleeding out. We might be able to slow things down, uh, but there's just no way around it. The corn, soybeans, um, annual crops generally are just inherently leaky. And uh, I don't want to den... What do I mean by leaky? Good question. Uh, what I mean by leaky is that they, uh, they don't hold on to water very well, uh, largely because the soil gets disturbed frequently, also because their rooting systems are shallow. And they don't, because they don't hold on to water very well, um, they exacerbate flooding downstream. But they also carry with them, with it, the water carries with it, uh, nutrients that are applied as fertilizer and manure to those cropping systems. So we get a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus that goes along for the ride with that water. And that nitrogen and phosphorus is devastating to our downstream ecosystems, lakes, streams, the ocean, Gulf of Mexico, Green Bay. Green Bay. There's an area of water body in Wisconsin that you can find that isn't polluted. I mean, if you go up north, you might find one or two spring-fed uh, lakes, but Everywhere you go, water is polluted, largely from agriculture. And you'll hear all kinds of things. Well, what about the contribution of septic systems? 
and there's certainly a signal there, but the majority of it is from agriculture. And I just want to be clear, I mean, I'm, I'm from the Department of Agronomy. I have brethren that I work side by side with who are, would be aghast that I'm saying these things right now. But that's just the way it goes. That's just what the science says. And that's our, been our experience now for almost 100 years. So why do we need to grow all these annual crops? This is a big question and it could get real metaphysical. Most of the corn that we produce, as you may know, goes to feed confined livestock. And whether those livestock are confined in dairy barns here in, in Wisconsin or beef livestock confined in Nebraska and Kansas and that sort of thing, about 40% of the corn we grow goes to confined livestock. And so we have to ask ourselves as a society, is that what we want? Is that how we want to produce livestock? There are alternatives that are healthier, not only for us, but for the livestock and for the ecosystems. Um, but there's a trade-off, and those systems tend to be less productive. They tend to squeeze less out of the land. They tend to squeeze less out of the animal. That's part of the point. That's why they're healthier. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I wanted to say one more thing. Uh, I started talking about livestock production in confinement situations. Where was I going? Oh, well, I'll come back to it. I was talking about annuals being leaky. Thank you. Um, these cropping systems that we grow that are annuals, corn and soybeans and whatnot, they demand a tremendous amount of nutrients and pesticides in order to maintain that productivity to squeeze as much as we can out of that system. Oh. Thank you. It's where the stuff is going. So 40% of that corn is going to feed livestock in confinement. Uh, 35 to 40% of it is going to uh, our gas tanks. We have to ask ourselves as a society, is that what we should be doing? Squeezing our land and extracting resources from our land so we can drive it? These are hard questions. I'm not saying I have easy answers, but we have to have these conversations. And the rest of it, primarily goes to making high fructose corn syrup for Coca-Cola and Pepsi and whatnot. So the stream, if you're looking at where this stuff is going, and I think there's a there's good cause for us to ask, should we be doing this? Should we be scaling it down? Where are the beans going? The beans are going to food additives. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it does get mixed back into food rations for livestock but the oil gets squeezed out and the oil gets used for, for food products. Helps make the, uh, as Michael Pollan calls it, the center part of the grocery store where all the boxes are of crackers and cookies. It helps keep them soft and malleable and not get brittle. Let's talk about biodiversity. You know, these annual cropping systems are devastating for biodiversity. It's pretty clear that uh, we're driving birds towards extinction in lots of places. They've been extirpated, not extinct, but extirpated from lots of places. Arthropod numbers are, are dwindling. We know about pollinator abundance going down as a result of insecticides that we spray, neonicotinoids, etc. The list goes on and on. Biodiversity is devastated as a result of these annual cropping systems being so dominant. And remember now one thing I needed to say for sure. I am not saying this to impugn or back into a corner, any farmer who's doing this, any farmer who's doing this or has been doing this is responding to macroeconomic signals that we as a society have set up for them. It's not that they're nefarious monsters who are saying, let's mess up the earth and get everything we can out of it. Maybe there's a few, I, I don't think so. I think they all feel like they're helping feed the world. When I talk to them, that's what they say. And I believe them. Um, but we just have to have a broader conversation, I think, about whether that's actually what's happening or not and how we can help them feed the world. So if our current systems are bleeding out, there are ways that we can produce livestock. You know, a big part of what we're doing with that corn and beans is feeding livestock. There are ways we can feed livestock or better yet, we, there are ways that we can have livestock feed themselves by bringing them out onto grass like this and letting them graze that grass. And uh, by letting them spread their manure themselves and their urine 
and to spread it around in a, dis in a distributed and diffuse way. And I just want to be clear here too that uh, just to have livestock grazing isn't enough. It has to be good, well-managed grazing. Uh, I saw a lot of not so well-managed grazing on the way out here and thought to myself, I need to stop and take a picture and say, this is not what we mean. And what we don't mean is when we talk about not so well-managed grazing is so-called continuous grazing, where livestock are just let out in, into an area and left to roam and graze however they want, wherever they want, whenever they want. It's not just turning them out into the North 40. It's intensive management. It's uh, going out and paying attention to the grass. It's uh, measuring the grass and how productive it is in one area and not in another area. So it really is, it drives the farmer back to the land and helps the farmer um, sort of communicate with the land, listen to the land, and be adaptive and responsive to the land. And there are lots of people who have done this, who have either started doing this or made a conversion. And I don't think they really knew that that was gonna be a part of it, this benefit of like, I'm back in touch with the land now. I'm back in touch with this system. I'm managing the land, not just growing livestock. Um, and I'm not a farmer, so I don't wanna to get too poetic or nostalgic about it. But I hear this story a lot from folks who uh, turn to grazing. I think the key thing is to understand that agriculture has a huge role to play in conservation. I think people in this part of the world already understand that to a large degree, um, but understand that the basis of that agriculture has to be perennial grassland. And um, that's the only way we're gonna get the kinds of ecosystem services that we need out of our landscapes. And this is a beautiful place to test and explore and, and develop Grassland 2.0. The benefits of well-managed grazing are very clear, but there's a big but. And that but is uh, there's nuance in the way we manage and where we manage. And that keeps people like me in business for doing research projects to help understand what is that nuance. So uh, continuous grazing, I think is pretty clear, um, encourages undesirable plant species thistles and other, other weeds that we don't want in the system. One of the goals of rotational grazing is to maintain as uniform a grass stand as you can with clover in it for nitrogen uh, fixation, but to maintain a nice uniform pasture that is dense and keeps those weeds out, that keeps them out of the system. Continuous grazing, it's clear uh, reduces the grass plant's ability to hold on to water and nutrients the way we want them to. Uh, because the plant is constantly trying to rebuild its photosynthetic apparatus, it doesn't have the ability to put energy below ground and do the things we want those grass plants to do, which is to grow a very deep, fibrous, dense root system that's constantly turning over, which means growing and dying when it doesn't find what it wants, growing other places, and creating a sod that is like a sponge that can hold on to water and nutrients. So uh, we have to allow the plants a chance to, as Dick Cates, my, uh, my grazing buddy, likes to say, uh, put money in the bank. You gotta put money in the bank. You gotta put it below ground first. Then you can take what's above. Sorry, I promised Dick I wouldn't imitate him anymore. <laughs> Whenever I come out to Dick's farm, he looks at me and he says, your work is so meaningful to me. And he means it. And he says that to everybody. I always tell him, Dick, you tell that, you say that to everybody. Anyway, so don't get me going on Dick Cates. But there are people like Dick Cates, maybe nobody like Dick Cates. He's one of a kind. But there are lots of graziers who are grass farmers like Dick Cates, uh, who are managing the land and, and doing it really well. And they're managing it for productivity and uh, they're managing it for biodiversity. So one of the things that's clear is uh, my colleague, Laura Payne, who Marcy knows, did a lot of research in the 80s and 90s with grazing, showing that um, well-managed grazing could actually enhance biodiversity. It could actually enhance trout stream habitat. It could actually enhance uh, bird habitat, um, but it has to be done carefully and 
there has to be some trial and error and what works one year might not work the next and this is part of that adaptive nature of managed grazing. Then that brings me to carbon and of course everybody wants to know about how to take carbon out of the atmosphere and there's a lot of discussion about regenerative agriculture. The notion is that regenerative agriculture is like I'm saying putting it back in the soil taking what you can but still putting back in the soil <clears throat> and I'll just say that we know grasslands can build carbon in the soil under certain climates under past climates they certainly did the reason that soil accumulates at all is because over the millennia there's more input of carbon to the terrestrial environment than there is output to the atmosphere. And right now that's not happening. Right now there's more output to the atmosphere from the soil than there is input from the plants. But that's not in, in well-managed grasslands, it's just in all this. Well, this is the nuance that I want to get to. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. And so we have to be really careful because there are a lot of folks out there trying to sell soil carbon credits and schemes for you know paying farmers for soil carbon which i am all for but i think we have to be careful that if those schemes go down the road of like trying to measure soil carbon like how much carbon did you gain robert in the last year uh last year robert may have managed very well but actually lost soil carbon because soil carbon largely is driven by the climate and we're in a situation now where the climate is on a trajectory upward it is clearly getting warmer at night. It is clearly getting warmer in the winter time, in the springtime. And those are all periods when there's no plant growth. But the microbes in the soil are still doing their thing. And in fact, when the temperature goes up, those microbes are like, hey, let's get some carbon. <laughs> and part of that, hey, let's get some carbon for our own bodies is they respire a lot of it back off to the atmosphere. So if we're stimulating that carbon off-gassing microbial production of carbon if we're stimulating it preferentially over the grass then we're going to get less and less carbon in the soil so that's what we're fighting against it's a very scary and sad story it's the same story you've heard about permafrost in polar regions that the permafrost is melting and and as a result the microbes are getting access to carbon that's been frozen it's going into the atmosphere it's a positive feedback to climate change it's a scary proposition now let me just say that if there's any ag system that has a chance of putting carbon back in the soil it's grazing grassland the best way to do it would be to restore prairie everywhere and burn it occasionally and maybe let some bison roam, roam around on it I'm guessing we're not going there with our entire livestock production system anytime soon. So the middle point there would be managed grazing on cool season pastures that are very productive, that we're not squeezing like we do in these annual systems to get every last ounce of productivity out of it because we have to feed the soil. And it's complicated. And, and believe me, the frontier of soil science is like, why isn't that carbon staying in the soil? And there's uh, lots of folks in my lab and people at UW and everywhere else in the world who are trying to understand, is it something about the microbes? Can we manipulate who those microbes are and they'll do a better job of holding on to that carbon? Is it something about the plants? You know, so these are all open questions that are being debated. So you mentioned cool season grasses. Are hot season grasses unable to do this building up of carbon in the soil? No, warm season grass, so-called warm season grasses actually do it better because uh, they in this part of the world, warm season grasses are our prairie plants. And so Indian grass, switchgrass, big blue stem, you know, the poster children of prairie. Uh, those warm season plants have very extensive root systems and roots are the key to building soil carbon. These cool season grasses that we're on now, they're very productive and they have a very dense fibrous root system, but it's shallower, these cool season grasses, it's shallower than uh, the warm season grasses but it's still dense and fibrous enough that they're contributing um, carbon into the soil system. <clears throat> I'll go down a little rabbit hole for a minute. 
We have this project at uh, the Arlington Ag Research Station north of UW of Madison. It's called the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial, WIXT. It's a 30-year long-term long experiment. And we have in that experiment continuous corn, corn and soybeans, alfalfa and corn, a whole gradient, all the way down to prairie. We have managed grazing on cool season grass as one of them. Uh, let's set prairie aside for a minute. The only system over 30 years, sorry, 20, the 30 years cores are just coming out of the ground last fall and we're still working on them. After 20 years, the only system accruing any carbon was the managed pasture, but only in the upper 30 centimeters. If you go all the way down to a meter, that system didn't lose, but it didn't gain. It just held on to what it had. So that was on what, on what grasses? Cool season pasture grasses. And so we have lots of questions that we're trying to explore now. Is that because the rooting system of those cool season grasses is so shallow? Most of the roots are in the upper 30 centimeters. Uh, we haven't gotten to the prairie yet. We don't know if it's holding on below ground or not. So lots of unanswered questions there. One thing that was really fascinating about that work is that when we took those deep soil cores all the way down to a meter, uh, and we took some of those soils and we put them in a jar and brought them home and measured the carbon that was coming off the gas. And we ran it through a radioisotope spectrometer and the carbon coming off was on average 500 years old. So what's coming off of the soil down there is old prairie carbon that had accumulated down there, you know, over the millennia. The prairies are what, 3000 years old out there. So. Fascinating stuff. Don't let me go down this rabbit hole. Uh, it's it's good stuff though, soil carbon. I want to get way out way out over my skis here and talk about economics a little bit, finances. Because okay, this is all well and good that these cool season grasslands grazed by livestock can do all these ecosystem processes, right? They can provide us all these ecosystem functions that we want, but. The retort you often get is this sort of false dichotomy, like, I still got to make a living. How are farmers going to make a living? And what's very clear from the literature, so the scientific literature, the economic literature, when they've done side-by-side -side studies and comparisons, managed grazing for dairy is almost twice as profitable, two times as profitable. And this is like a time series analysis from 1993 to 2005, you know, across all kinds of price fluctuations and uh, costs of imp uh, uh, production and all this kind of thing. And it, and it was a lot of dairies. It wasn't just like, let's pick the best managed grazing dairy and compare, compare it to the worst confinement dairy. And it was robust to geography. It's played out in Maryland. It's played out in Michigan. It played out here in Wisconsin. It's twice as profitable. And what I always hear from farmers, and again, this is not me casting aspersions on farmers, because I get it. But what I always hear from farmers is, hey, show me the money. If it's more profitable, I'll do that. You know, you want to pay me for that? I'll do that. So why aren't they doing that? It's not an economic thing, I think. And again, I don't think it's because farmers want to do poorly by the environment. So what is it? We think, I think we have good evidence for this, that it's primarily social and political and the transition costs are enormous. So it's, it may be more profitable, but I've invested in all this steel and infrastructure and a way of thinking. And now you're telling me I don't need all this. What am I going to do with it? So these are the huge impediments to getting more of this grazing uh, uh, grassland out on the, on the landscape, we think. Yeah. And so what you're seeing with all the old lands that used to generate, you know, uh, forage for dairy and pasture is they're converting to cropping and a lot of farmers are working off the farm. Right. They're right. That's absolutely the trajectory we're on. And if you look at the data, it's very scary. Uh, 
right. in two, uh, let me get this right. I got here from California in 2003 and there were over 16,000 dairies in Wisconsin. Today there are less than 7,000. And it's been a linear downward trajectory. And if you continue that linear trajectory, by the year 2030, there'll probably be five dairies in Wisconsin. I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't know, but you know, where is it gonna plateau? Is it gonna plateau? Consolidation is definitely the way. So, and related to that is like, why wouldn't you choose a more profitable approach? Uh, and when I say social, I don't mean it's like people have problems and that's why they don't, they don't do it. I, like my economist friend, Brad Barm says to me, Randy, there's all kinds of things that would be more profitable for you to do, but you do them anyway. <laughs> Shall we start? And he's like, going out for a beer on Friday and uh, buying that uh, pickup right there when you could have bought something smaller. And, you know, so we all, it's not just farmers. We're all responding and living in this social world. Critically, there's this like, what does it mean to be a farmer? This sort of thing that, uh, in academic speak, we call uh, the in the individual interior, the self. You know, this gets way out over my skis here. But uh, who am I as a farmer, and what does it mean for me to be a farmer? And what do I owe to my parents who were farmers? If I do it differently, am I disparaging them? If I do something different, am I? explicitly indicating to the rest of the world that my parents were wrong and on and on. That's sort of the interior thing. We have to find a way to deal with that. And I don't mean deal with it like it's some sort of pathology. Like we have to acknowledge it and, and work with folks. Then there's this community interior thing. There's like these four quadrants. I'm trying not to make it academic, but this community interior thing that's more about like, who are we as a group of farmers? And, you know, we're the farmers that we meet at the coffee shop every week. And this is the way they all do it. And if I'm the first one to do something different, I won't be able to go down there anymore. I know how it feels. I walked into the gas station down there with a mask on earlier today, and <laughs> I was not one of that group. Um, they were all looking at me askance, like, you're not part of our group, big fella. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so there's this exterior um, internal thing. And those are way out of my, like, I just told you everything I know about it, except that one of the things that we're doing in Grassland 2.0 to engage this is convene what we call learning hubs which are just sit downs, workshops, things like this, with trying to get folks together who usually don't talk to each other or who talk a different language. And critically, what we're doing in, those, in that context is putting models of the landscape up on the screen. And these models have been designed so that we can just turn the dials on them very, and in a, and in a very, uh, immediate way get a response so it's sort of like if you know sim city you know you can kind of des design the city well this software is meant to be like can we design the landscape what if we take that corn and put it in grass and put some corn over here maybe that's more benign because it's not going to get to the waterway so it's like a safe space to reconfigure the landscape or the individual farm and press go and see what the ramifications are uh, wow, that would actually increase my profitability to not grow corn right up to the road or right up to the whatever. Um, if I planted grass in this part of the farm, it would actually sequester carbon in the soil or it would be more likely to sequester carbon in the soil. You can see here why it's so important to get those equations right. And then part of that conversation is then, what are the opportunities to help Robert as farmer A in this meeting get paid for storing that carbon in the soil? 
Maybe he can even get paid more for storing that carbon than squeezing some more corn out of it. But what's critical is that Robert, sorry to pick on you, Robert, but. That's fine. You know, I made a joke one time about playing my entire lawn in Brady Sheen downtown in corn, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, Robert. So uh, Robert uh, is sitting there, but he's sitting there with his peers and they see Robert struggling with like, if I did that, what would happen? And then he's hearing from his peers that, yeah, they'd be willing to try that. And I'm, you know, maybe I'm simplifying it and making it Pollyanna, but there's this group dynamic that we hope helps overcome this. What will, what will the neighbors think if I plant corn in my front yard? Well, if all the neighbors are there when I actually see the model and go, wow, this corn's gonna make me twice as profitable, I'm going for it. I've already acknowledged to the world and my community that I'm gonna make a change. And so it's not like one day I have to pull the drapes closed and wait and see who's gonna throw tomatoes at me. Anyway, I don't know anything about all this stuff. We have social scientists and uh, folks that actually do and so um, they're helping us convene these these meetings and these sessions and we're very likely to have a learning hub out here in this part of the world that's situated around Kickapoo and Tanner Creek and Valley Stewardship Network etc so we're very excited about that. Uh, SNAP Plus is actually being built into our modeling program because farmers know SNAP Plus they're comfortable well, I don't know if they're comfortable with it they might hate it but uh, they know that it's important to use for nutrient management. And so part of trust building with them is like, here's SNAP Plus. Can't you see that it actually is doing what you think it's doing? You've used SNAP Plus. You know, your agent uh, has helped you use SNAP Plus. Um, and then from there, we build out the model to include a lot of things that SNAP Plus doesn't include. SNAP Plus is very focused on phosphorus. And, and sediment and soil erosion and productivity. Our model has those things plus nitrogen loss and biodiversity. And um, we're actually building some of these social economic indicators into it as well, like job creation in the community. And um, now I'm really getting out over my skis again, but um, quality of life metrics, these types of things. So our model for our grassland project is called SmartScape. Most ecosystem models, they simulate what the ecosystem's doing, but they take a tremendous amount of runtime. And so in the old days, we would try and do this stakeholder engagement like I've described, and it'd be like, okay, what if we put the corn there and the grass there? Okay, we'll be back in two weeks after we run the computer model, and then we'll come back and present you with the results. Uh, this has been simplified so that we can just turn the dials and go, ooh, now you can see in real time what the outcome will be. But that gives up a little bit of precision. So the f subsequent steps would be like if we get to an actual planning phase, okay, now let's do the more sophisticated modeling and get some more accurate or precise uh, output and see, what, see what's gonna happen. This is all so selling on the open com uh, competitive market. It's all because of reduced cost of production. And in particular, the cost of growing corn and the cost of growing soybeans, putting fuel in the tractor, uh, keeping the cows heated and warm at night when instead they're out just grazing pasture. Uh, so it's feed costs and other production costs. That said, there are folks like Wisconsin Meadows uh, uh, Beef Cooperative that are trying to develop markets and develop a uh, price premium, if you will, for grass-fed products. Organic Valley is obviously trying to take advantage of this now. Um, so there's hope that we can get a price premium as well. The obvious uh, conversation there is like, do we end up with a price premium that um, discourages the less affluent from accessing those? And we don't want that. So we have to figure out that too. I get in big trouble about this all the time within our group that I plant the flag on grasslands too strongly. I think I might have done that today. But the reason I do that, if there's another ag system out there that can do the things we need, hold on to soil, hold on to nutrients, create biodiversity, foster biodiversity, I wanna hear about it, let's talk about it. But I don't think there is, just based on science and data and experience. So, 
the starting point with the Tanner Creek Watershed Council or the Valley Stewardship Network conversation, whatever, however that triangulates. It has to be, what do you all want? You have to live it. We're here with models, but our thing is like, we don't want to be part of the conversation if it's going to be like a halfway, you know, band-aid on the, on the system type of uh, solution. So, Marcy. I just wanted to add to that. That, that was one of the things that came up in the initial conversation is um, that if, if this area becomes a learning hub, we want to be a part from the ground up. Like, we hear issues with how do we maintain fencing in rotation grading? How do we find a market for it? Um, right now, processing, maybe Sandy and Vic can talk to that. You know, where do you get the market for it beyond Organic Valley right. or, or something like that? How does this work for everybody around us? That's true. We self-market right now, and we have seen our normal processing time appointments taken up, and prices for that are volatile, too. Yeah. That processing prices are going up, so we're trying to keep our prices the same so people still want to purchase it. Yeah. Yep. Right, and, and you know, maybe the pandemic offers opportunities that we don't know about, well, but I'm, from what I'm our hearing... recent processing, that has increased the need for our product. We had to turn people away. We have a waiting list for our next processing. So I think that's due to the pandemic. Absolutely. It's also driving the price. Yeah, we've heard that story across the board that um, the, the, the uh, supply chains have been laid bare and the shorter supply chains have been in full demand and uh, it's been a hardship for a lot of people. It's been a boon for some, but these issues of supply chain, though, that you're bringing up, Marcy, are a critical part of our Learning Hub discussions. And Nick Jordan, who's uh, one of our project PIs from Minnesota, his expertise is convenient. You know, if, if, if my expertise is more about soil carbon modeling and this sort of thing, uh, his expertise is how do we identify and develop mm, what he calls value added supply chains, values added supply chains. So I don't know the answer to that, <laughs> but I know that it involves like having farmers and, and, and suppliers and processors around the table and doing, you know, what I envision is like work on a whiteboard like, if we don't have more processors, this is not going to happen. How are we going to get more processors? We need investment capital. Where are we going to get investment capital? We actually have a financial investment person on the team who's working with bankers and lenders and big investors who want their money to do good to try and convince them, like, this is going to be doing good. Because according to him, and this is, again, way outside of my expertise, there is so much money out there that wants to get invested in something that they know is doing good, but the knowing that it's doing good is the hard part. It gets, it gets back to the... <laughs> There's so much money out there. <laughs> the Wall Center Pasture Project came before us. They've been out here doing that hard work with uh, Tanner Creek Watershed Council and Valley Stewardship Network, and uh, they're part of Grassland 2.0. They're one of the sub-awards in the project along with Savannah Institute, Michael Fields Ag Institute, the Land Institute in Kansas, I know I'm forgetting somebody, the Croatan Institute. Is there a website? Greenland's Blue Waters. Grassland 2.0? There will be in a matter of weeks. We actually have an official launch date where we're going to have an announcement and social media and all that kind of stuff emerging October 19th. Press release. I've never done that before. So. I've been talking a lot. I love the questions, so keep them coming or conversation. Is this kind of farming mostly associated with organic farming or non-organic also? I would say it's primarily not organic, although uh, organic milk production has to use pasture, so they're required to have some grazing. 
this is a very controversial topic because there are big organic producers in <coughs> Texas and New Mexico that are gaming the system and anyway don't I don't want to go down that road so um, grazing and pasture is a big part of organic but I would say that the sector that's grass-fed is bigger than that I mean organic is as, as huge and important as it is, it's constrained because they limit the number of farmers they can have, you know, to match supply and demand. I would say there's more grass farmers out there that are not organic, but you know, maybe Robert knows differently. I, that's, I will say that one of the things that Grassland 2.0 is engaged in, Brad Barham, who's this economist I mentioned, is leading a survey of all dairy producers in the state of Wisconsin. And he's really working hard to make sure he gets a good return across all sectors, not just grazing, uh, because he really wants to understand what's out there now, what are people doing. And part of the survey is like trying to understand who is likely to be amenable to a conversation about making change. Some people are just dug in and I heard it from a farmer the other day, I'd rather die broke than go do grazing. I'd rather die broke doing it this way. You know, and again, I think it comes back to like, this is the way we've always done it. And you're here telling me I'm wrong. Conversation's over. So we have to be careful about that. I have a question. So these programs that you're talking about, are you like specifically reaching out to young farmers who maybe aren't set in their ways and are still aspirational because they're going to live long enough to see the results? And might be more open to making yeah part of this great question part of this is like developing all manner of entry points for young people and young people are dying to get back to the land young people are dying to get back out on the farm I help uh, oversee the agroecology master's program at UW and every year we bring in 15 or 20 new super smart students and I'd say half of them end up going out and trying to farm on their own and the more opportunities there are for young people to get on the land uh, not only does, do the demographics look better, the average age for, of farmers these days is 65. Um, new ideas, fresh ideas, and this is a big part of that Jedi thing. Diverse sets of ideas, you know, need to get out on the landscape. My friend said to me uh, recently, um, you know, farming is really tough and people are going out of business left and right. But what happens when they go out of business? Uh, they're their children end up trying to do something with the land and generally it's the same thing or a little bit different. We need to infuse some more diverse uh, ideas into what happens on the land. That's a huge, obviously a huge issue with inheritance and access to land. If we don't grow all these corn and beans, are we gonna be able to feed the world? And even if we <coughs> can't do that, you know, if those other people should feed themselves, um, are we gonna be able to feed ourselves? Mm. Great question, and I'm actually helping to develop a project right now that's looking at that. So I don't have an answer for you on num that have numbers right now, but we have done it in at a small scale in the Har River watershed, which has a lot of dairy production, big confinement dairies. And we basically ask, can the same amount of milk that's being produced, let me back up, can the same amount of milk that's being produced in the Har River watershed now be produced on grass? And the answer is yes as long as all the corn and beans go away and get turned into grass. So, um, but to your bigger point, I mean, we're not feeding the world now. That's always been a false narrative. Why? Well, I explained where the corn and soybeans go now. 40% uh, of it go to livestock that we end up buying and eating ourselves as meat. That's part of it, yeah. But is that feeding the world? You know, I mean, it's not going to the folks who are hungry. Uh, that narrative has always been the reason the world has hunger is because a lack of political will and a lack of resources and poverty. I guess so the last two things are the same. Also like degraded land. Once you can no longer use land for farming, that then in turn causes hunger and poverty. It's like the economic stuff you're talking about, I think. Yeah. 
And that, that of course is a massive issue with forest clearing in the tropics where they clear forest because they're trying to get access to land to raise cattle. Those soils are very thin and leaky. As soon as they cut down the forest, the nutrients just start going. So they get a couple of years of pasture out of it and then it's so degraded they can't even grow grass on it. So they go cut down some more forest. Pretty tragic. Yeah. Yeah, so I recently moved out here and I have a good amount of land that was farmed industrially and I'd like to switch to managed grazing. But I also am not- Is a this a hypothetical or is this no, real? Like, oh. real. Like, <laughs> and, but I'm not a farmer for my career. And at least right now I don't want to switch. But like, how, is there any way I can like get this done or start doing this without doing it all myself? Okay. Well, I think this is one of the uh, um, great opportunities to get more young people into, into grass farming is that if you have land, you're a landowner and you want someone to treat it well and manage it well, there has to be a, a matchmaking opportunity there. And I think that does happen to some degree now through our networks. We have these uh, grazing networks in the state. When I say we, I'm not, they're, they're um, it's called grass works. And it's kind of a clearinghouse in exchange for, hey, I know somebody who's got a herd and they're looking for a place to graze. And usually this, these people are uh, custom raising dairy heifers. So um, they haven't uh, entered into the milking uh, herd yet. And so, you know, a lot of dairy producers are just happy to, heifers are just feeding something that's not giving you any income. So they're looking for a way to get them off their farm anyway. And right now, a bunch of those heifers go to Nebraska and graze on rangeland, and then they get fed corn, and then they come back here. So um, looking for opportunities to do custom grazing of dairy heifers is one. Beef grazing is even simpler. <laughs>